Afternoon campers and welcome to my monthly roundup of everything that's going on in the world of microlight flying here in the UK in the month of May 2024. Welcome to Microlight News. Right, I've got a lot to get through this month, so let's get cracking. First story from Microlight Flying Magazine is an article written by Kath Spence, who's been speaking to a chap called Richard Tones. And this article is all about dealing with airfield emergencies, which is something that any one of us could face at any time. So this is clearly a very important area. So um, Kath says that spring has sprung. She's been dusting off her flying equipment after a bit of a break. She managed to grab a few circuits in between storms and downpours, which is ironic because today, being a bank holiday weekend, that is exactly what the weather is doing um, and Kath realised that she wasn't quite as smooth as the last time she went flying the only consolation being that she didn't appear to be the only person that was trying to land 10 feet above the runway on that day however good news um, there are loads of ways of brushing up on your flying skills and increasing your flying knowledge. The BMEA runs a WINGS scheme to help support that and we are very excited to be able to offer some new courses which we will be talking about in the next few months in this magazine. So what is the BMAA WINGS scheme? Well, I'll probably do a separate video on this because I think it's probably worth it. Um, but essentially, if you are a BMAA member and you are a qualified pilot or somebody that is working towards your MPPL qualification, then the WINGS scheme is a way that you can improve your piloting skills and increase your knowledge. Um, essentially, it's a series of awards that you can apply for from bronze, uh, silver, gold, right the way up to diamond, and they vary in complexity and difficulty as you work your way through the scheme. Um, if you go on the BMEA website, there is a separate wings section. I'll put a link to it in the description down below, and that will tell you all about it and give you the range of courses that you can do and what the requirements are for the different uh, levels. Essentially though, for each uh, award, if you want to apply for it, you have to attend uh, a number of courses or complete a number of courses. I say attend, some of them are online events, some of them are free, some of them you have to pay for, uh, so it doesn't have to cost an arm and a leg. Um, and then once you've completed the courses, which uh, range on a whole host of different types of topics, um, once you've completed the courses, you then have to complete a navigation exercise. The way that works is you have to plan a navigation exercise, uh, how long that navigation exercise is, how many legs are involved, how many air, uh, airfields you have to land at, vary depending on which level of award you're going for. But once you've planned the navigation exercise, you have to submit that to the BMAA. And then once you've submitted that and they've received it, you then go and fly the route. Um, and then after that, you submit your flight log to the BMAA and they compare um, your planning, so how long you've said it's going to take you, how much fuel you've said you've going to burn, they compare that with the actual figures. And provided you've estimated it to within a reasonable level of accuracy, I think it's about 10% or something like that, um, then they're quite happy to give you the award. Once you've got the award, they will then send you through the post a nice certificate. Uh, there's my bronze certificate up there and also a nice pin badge as well. So it's a nice thing to have. The most important thing though is that you will learn something and you will be a better pilot. So the wing scheme is definitely worth going to have a look at. One of the courses that you can now do on the wing scheme is the subject of this article, um, and that is a first aid course. Uh, Richard, who runs the course, tells us that he has an interest in medical care since he was young. Uh, he's then gone on to work as a healthcare professional and he's seen many medical emergencies in hospitals, as well as other situations such as on an aircraft going on holiday, uh, which he had to attend and help. Unfortunately, he's also uh, first hand. Uh, experience of small airfield emergencies involving a microlight that needed an immediate response. Uh, on a busy day at an airfield with pilots flying, lessons taking place and everyone generally having an enjoyable time in the sun. So I'm not sure which country he's talking about. Uh, not this one. Uh, we never stop to think of what would happen, for example, if somebody collapsed or somebody was choking, somebody stopped breathing. Uh, airfields are quite remote places as we know quite often uh, road access is a little bit limited um, and the way that people react in the first few minutes of an incident can make the difference between life and death. Now I've been told by my employer that I'm not really supposed to talk about what I do for a living on my YouTube channel which is a separate thing uh, and that's fair enough but suffice it to say I do work for one of the emergency services and I have done for about 28 years. 
um, and in that time I have seen more than my fair share of medical emergencies. Um, I have to attend three days of refresher training in first aid every year um, and now I have to attend all sorts of courses through, through my job and I have to be honest to say at most of them you'll find me sat in the back of the classroom with matchsticks propping my eyelids up. However for first aid I will make an exception and the reason for that is it's the one course where I learn something that I can take away and use outside of the work environment. Um, any one of us could be at a family barbecue for example, Uncle Bill will start choking on a prawn or somebody, somebody we know, a relative can drop on the floor, stop breathing um, and being able to know what to do in those circumstances and being able to deal with it and help um, really is an absolutely uh, life-saving skill. If you want to uh, learn those first aid skills then you can now do it through the WINGS scheme and Richard has a group called First Aid Aviation, very catchy title like that, um, and he is offering first aid courses to the aviation community. So if you are a member of a flying club and you are looking for a course to run um, then I would definitely stick first aid right up there at the top of the list. It is so important, it really is. Um, I'll, I say I'll put Kyle Richard's contact details on the screen in the description down below. If you make contact with him he will make those arrangements to run a course for you. Uh, the first one one has already been arranged and it's going to be at Darley Moor Airfield, would you believe, which is where I'm based, uh, with Mark Hilton and his team at Micro Aviation. So if you want to run a course, give, uh, give uh, Richard an email. Right, the second article in this month's magazine is an article which is tinged with a little bit of sadness really and that is uh, because it is to do with the closure of New Farm Airfield. Um, so this is a letter from uh, Courtney Chambers um, who owned and ran New Farm Airfield and basically uh, it says it is with incredible heavy heart that I have to announce the permanent closure of New Farm Airfield in Piddington, Northamptonshire. Um, I, I bumped into Courtney uh, a couple of weeks ago at the Popham uh, Microlite trade show and he was telling me all about it. Um, essentially, without going into any detail, unfortunately, Courtney's father passed away recently uh, along with his grandmother. Um, and uh, as a result of, uh, shall we say, family politics, um, the airfield has now had to close, which is an absolute shame. Um, I have visited New Farm Airfield on a number of occasions, both by land uh, and by air. Uh, and also Mrs. B has come along with me and we've camped over at a number of events. And on every occasion, we've been made to feel so welcome, um, almost part of the family. Um, and I can fully understand why Courtney uh, was recently awarded the Keith Neagle Trophy, um, which uh, it was handed to him at the, uh, the, the, the show at Popham. I've got some footage of that, I'll put that on the screen. His work to open and then operate New Farm Airfield, always with a smile and a willingness to help, it goes to Courtney Chambers. <laughs> Thoroughly well deserved, and, and, and for all the recognition of the hard work that he has uh, has put into um, to to, uh, to the airfield. Um, however, there is a little glimpse of, of hope. Uh, Courtney does say that that uh, although it might be the end of New Farm, it's not the end of his dream. Uh, it may be some time before I can fund and create a new and hopefully better airfield. Um, in an unknown uh, location as yet. Uh, the phoenix will rise from the ashes and until that day I just want to say a very big thank you to um, all, for, for all of your support uh, over the last years. Uh, Courtney I think I speak for a lot of people when I say uh, we owe you a big debt of thank you for all the events that you've put on in the past. Um, I hope you your dream does come true and you get a new airfield and um, if you build it we will all definitely come. Right, the next bit of news that uh, could affect uh, microlight pilots and GA pilots in general, uh, and this is to do with the CAA's proposed changes to the Manchester Low Level Corridor. So just for anybody that's not familiar with the Low Level Corridor, um, in the northwest of the UK, in between Liverpool and Manchester, there is some really, really busy airspace at two very busy airports. Um, without the Low Level Corridor, anybody that wanted to fly from the Midlands up towards, say, the Lake District or the other way around uh, would have two options they would either have to fly over water or they would have to go out of the way and fly over some quite uh, inhospitable uh, sort of high terrain. Uh, so the low level corridor, as its name suggests, is a corridor in between the two that GA pilots can use to get from um, the, the, the Midlands up towards the, um, the sort of Lake District area. At the moment, the low level corridor is Class D airspace. Um, however, um, unlike other Class D airspace, there is an exemption which allows pilots to fly in it without ATC clearance, provided a number of conditions are met. I won't go into any detail. I might put them up on the screen as to what those are. However, that exemption is due to end at the end of May this year. 
and the CAA have identified that there is a uh, potential risk of uh, mid-air collisions in that corridor. The corridor is quite narrow and it's not very tall and there is a lot of traffic going through it. So there has been an identified risk of mid-air collisions. Also, there are very, very limited land out options for anybody flying along the low level corridor because you are flying over effectively what is a lot of urban sprawl. So the CAA have decided that they are going to make some changes or they are proposing some changes. The proposed changes are all available for anybody to read online in CAP 2992A, it's online. Um, essentially though, the changes can be summarized as follows. So firstly, they are talking about reclassifying the current Class D airspace in the low level corridor to Class G airspace. Um, also implementing a restricted area within the uh, reclassified airspace, um, changing the altitude of the corridor. At the moment, it's 1300 feet and they are uh, gonna add 200 feet onto that to make it 1500 feet and also uh, creating a a slightly wider section of the corridor which is also going to be class G. So they are the proposed changes. Um, the CAA are seeking your views on those proposed changes and I'll put something on the screen as to how you can respond to this consultation process. Um, you've got until the 16th of July to uh, respond. The CAA are saying that uh, they believe that these changes uh, will benefit the UK airspace as a whole by improving safety in the Manchester low level route whilst maintaining equi equitable access. Uh, safety has been at the forefront of the design process and the proposed changes is expected to have a positive impact on safety in the region, which has got to be a good thing. Uh, the feedback from stakeholders has been extremely positive, indicating that the amendment should improve safety by simplifying the airspace and reducing the risk of unintentional uh, infringements. And the proposal aims to provide more Class G airspace, reducing congestion for GA traffic and offering more options for emergency landings, further enhancing safety. Now, me personally, um, I'm all for Class G airspace. It's where I like to fly. So any proposal that's going to give us more Class G airspace for me gets a thumbs up. Um, if you want to have your say, uh, click on the description, on the link that I'll put in the description down below. And as I say, uh, you have got until the 16th of July to put in your response. From the forum, so what have people been saying online about microlighting? Well, first off, I just want to uh, go back to something I mentioned in my last microlight news where I spoke about some statistics that the BMA had put out, and in particular one statistic which showed that the number of MPPL microlight flex wing applications had been steadily falling over a number of years. Um, and initially I looked at that when I was quite pessimistic, thinking, well, oh, flex wings in decline, and you know, the number of flex wing pilots is going through the floor. However, I had a comment from longtime subscriber Patrick McCowan. Patrick Patrick, hope you well. Um, and he said, is the bigger two-seater flexwing trikes in decline and the smaller single-seaters increasing? Um, and that comment got me thinking about this. Um, and, and when I think back to when I first started flying uh, in 2017, I would go into the hangar at Darlingmoor and there would be perhaps five or six flexwing aircraft in the hangar. Uh, if I go into that same hangar today, there are probably closer to 20 flexwing aircraft in that hangar the majority of which are single seat flex wings, uh, the majority of those being sub 70 uh, flex wing aircraft. So I've had a rethink and I think the, the situation isn't as pessimistic as I thought and we probably have more flex wing pilots now than we have ever had, thank you to the influx of sub 70 aircraft. Um, the problem is I don't know how to quantify it. How do I find out how many active flex wing pilots there currently are in the UK? Bearing in mind that a lot of them are unlicensed, um, and perhaps aren't members of the BMAA or the BHPA or anything like that. So if anybody's got any idea how I would actually quantify that number, then please leave me a comment uh, below um, uh, so I can see uh, if we are actually in decline or if the numbers are going up. Uh, I just wanted to clarify that point though and just say that things aren't as bad as I perhaps made out. Right, the next uh, online bit of activity that got me quite excited was an email that I received from Fred White, who is one of the developed of Avinet. Now, I've already spoken about Avinet in previous videos. Um, if you look on my previous Microlight News video from last month, I did a bit of a section on Avinet, talked about what it is, and also gave you a bit of a demonstration. So go and have a look at that. Um, but just to bring you up to speed for anybody that doesn't know what it is, Avinet is an application that you can download onto your phone, whether it be an iPhone or Android. 
and it lets you share your flight details with uh, with friends, uh, other pilots, colleagues, whatever. Uh, it lets you share your details of your flight track, your height, where you've been, all that sort of stuff. And it's a fantastic app. Think Strava for pilots and, and you're pretty much about there. So um, this is a new app. It's under constant development. If you look at the release notes of the app, you will see that Fred and Josh, the two developers, are continually pushing out new updates all the time with improvements. The latest improvement is an absolute game changer, which I really, really think is going to increase the popularity of this app. Previously, um, if you've used, for example, Skydemon to log your flight, you could upload that flight to Avinet. But the process for doing that, I have to say, was a bit slow and a bit clunky. Um, you would have to download the uh, flight track from Skydemon as a, is it a GPX file or a KML file or something like that. Um, store that file on your computer somewhere, then go into the Avinet app and then upload that file to Avinet. Um, so it worked, but it was slow and clunky. Um, they have now automated that process, which I think is going to make this a game changer. And um, uh, Fred uh, has said, uh, we're really excited about this one. We believe it's a step in the right direction towards an automated future. For all of the Skydemon users out there, you can now use the share via email feature of your Skydemon flight log to automate the upload process. Basically, if you go into Skydemon after you've logged a flight, look at your flight log. There's a little button at the bottom that says send by email. You click on that and you put in an email address of upload at Avinet dot app that is it that then sends your flight straight to Avina. it's all done it's automated it's it's it really is a slick process i've tried it and it works and it works brilliantly so if you've previously tried Avinet but you've been put off by that slightly clunky uh, way of uploading your flight details to Avinet, it is now changed they have fixed that problem go and have another look at it i'll put the discrete the the details in the description below Right, the next online thing that I want to talk about, and that is to do with an online petition that's been doing the rounds recently, which was to try and encourage the government to consider reclassifying airfields from brownfield sites to greenfield sites. Um, and the reason that this petition was brought about was because of the huge problem that we are facing at the moment with our airfields being under threat of closure for housing developments. And we know that this is a, a problem and it's a big problem and perhaps bigger than you might realise. Um, if you go on the General Aviation Awareness Council website, they have produced a list of airfields that are currently under threat from housing developments. There are currently 38 airfields on that list, um, which makes such depressing reading. Just to give you some examples, um, Bourne Aerodrome, uh, site marked for 3,500 homes, Chalgrove, site uh, included in South Oxfordshire District Council for 3,000 home development. Dean Thorpe accepted uh, the site for development of for 1500 home garden village. Dunsfold planning application for mixed use development with 1800 homes on site and the list goes on and on and on. Um, Abingdon Aerodrome site marked for a garden village uh, development with 1200 homes. Um, this makes such depressing reading it really is upsetting. Uh, Long Marsden local plan adopted core strategy for housing and has government garden village approval. Tolerton in Nottingham land earmarked for 4000 homes. Sibson uh, site is still listed in the council's house housing plan, Popham, um, the site proposed for 3,000 home garden village. And uh, as I say, there are many more on the list, which really, really is quite sad. So this petition uh, was doing the rounds. Uh, on the way down to Popham on my bike, I was trying to encourage people to sign that petition. And I said then, I don't know if it will make any difference. Um, unfortunately, I now know the answer to that question. And it seems like initially um, it's not going to make a difference. The government have responded to that uh, petition because it's had the re prerequisite 10,000 signatures. And the government response is as follows. Firstly, we are not seeking to alter airfield classification at this current time. Uh, which is uh, which is which is not the response we wanted. Uh, they go on to say the government recognised the importance of the general aviation industry for supporting key services as well as training and commercial use. Critical to GA success is the network of airfields which reflect the diversity in the sector, differing in size and infrastructure capability, ranging from smaller airfields offering training and educational opportunities to larger regional and international business aviation hubs. They all have an important role in supporting the aviation sector. 
that all sounds quite supportive, doesn't it? However, this is where it gets a little bit, uh, a little bit ropey. Um, it is for the local planning authorities to make individual decisions based on the planning policy and guidance that reflect the local context and engagement with local stakeholders. So basically, the government are passing the book saying it's down to local authorities to make decisions on where they're going to build houses. So it looks like we're going to have to fight these on an individual basis. Um, yeah, certainly in terms of Popham, I know there is a, an organisation that's been set up to try and fight the housing development proposed at Popham. I think it's called Popham Flying Matters or something along those lines. Uh, I'll put something on the screen. Um, for, for, for Popham's example, you can uh, log onto that website and you can add your name to the list of supporters. I think you have to pay a fee, which is only a pound, which is nothing, but it adds your voice to that weight of support. And I think we're going to have to do it on an individual basis. So if your local airfield is under threat, do something about it, give them your support. Right, just before we move on to community notices, there was one more online post that I wanna talk about because this highlights a very important safety issue. And this was a post from Jez Walsh, um, who I got to meet the other week at Popham uh, on the Flylight stand. Jez, it was uh, it was nice to finally meet you. Um, and this post, it relates to his first flight in a flex wing of the year, which didn't go as planned. Uh, during climb out, my primer bulb split, causing an air leak. Uh, I checked it before takeoff and it seemed fine as it primed the engine, but I'm guessing there was a split uh, that I didn't see and the vibration caused the split to get worse on climb out. Uh, thankfully, uh, Jez had plenty of altitude and landing options, although dragging the aircraft back to the hangar wasn't fun. Right, well, first of all, Jez, well done for getting it down in one piece without any damage to yourself or the aircraft. Uh, and second, this does highlight a point I've mentioned in the past, and that is the importance of checking your primer bulb. Um, this time of year, a number of people are going to be returning to flying after a bit of a break. They're going to be returning their aircraft to the air after a bit of a break. So if your aircraft does have a primer bulb, make sure that you check it. And when I say check it, I don't just mean have a look, I mean actually physically get your hands on, have a poke and have a prod and have a twist about because there will be cracks in that primer bulb that will not show themselves until you actually manipulate the bulb and have a good look. Um, I did do a video last year, I think it was all about primer bulbs and not just primer bulbs, but also rubber things to check on your aircraft. Um, I'll put a link to that video up here or up here, whichever side it is. So go and have a look at that. Um, there will be people no doubt that will leave comments on this video saying that uh, Ian White, I'm thinking of you in particular, uh, leaving comments comments basically saying that primer bulbs are the work of the devil and we should avoid them at all costs. And yes, if you can operate without a primer bulb, then I would advise you to take it out. However, if like me, you've got, uh, it's like, for example, I've got a Triton carburetor. It doesn't have a priming button on it. So the only way I can build up enough pressure is with a primer bulb. So it's a necessary evil for me, but I do check it every year and I also swap it every 12 months. So if you've got a primer bulb, make sure you check it before you take out your take off. Community news. So this is the bit of the video where I tell you what I've been up to and what I've got planned. So firstly, if you follow the channel, you will see that I finally made it to the Pop and Microlite trade show uh, this year uh, for the first time. What a fantastic event that was. The stuff that was there to see was uh, amazing. Um, standout things for me. Firstly, it was the Stamp SV4 um, uh, airplane. Now, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a flex wing person, not a fixed wing person. But even so, this thing was an incredible machine, uh, a beautiful looking aircraft. And to think that that is or soon to be a microlight just shows what a long way microlighting in the UK has come, particularly now that we've got the uh, 600 kilogram uh, weight limit. However, the, um, the the standout feature, the star of the show for me, definitely was the Delta Jet 500 Stingray Flexwing. What a uh, an incredible looking machine that is. Um, that is definitely on my wish list. Uh, unfortunately, it's probably going to stay on my wish list. But if I had the funds, I would put my order in tomorrow for one of those machines. A lovely looking thing. Uh, right, what else have I been up to? Um, or what have I got planned? Right, so uh, I was going to go flying this weekend. It is a bank holiday weekend, so you can guess what the weather's like. It ain't flyable. Um, so I've been busy, though. Uh, I have just put the finishing touches to a video which has been requested more than anything else, really. Uh, and that is how much does it cost to fly a microlight? How much does it cost to get your license? How much does it cost once you've got your license to carry on flying? Um, how much do the air exams cost, your equipment cost? All of that sort of stuff, insurance, hangarage, all that sort of stuff. Um, I've put all the figures down on a piece of 
paper, um, they're, they're, those figures turn out to be quite surprising. So um, I have just put the finishing touches to that video. It will be coming out soon if you want to see it because you're interested in that sort of thing. Uh, you may be thinking of giving this a go. You're just wondering how much it all costs. Then uh, subscribe to the channel, click the bell icon so that when that video pops up, uh, you will see it. Right, it's turning out to be a uh, proper busy uh, summer this year. I've got loads of stuff planned. So first of all, uh, the Western Park Model Air Show I'm, I'm hoping to fly into. Uh, I did fly into that last year, but I only stayed for the day. This year, I am hoping to camp over um, so that I can also see the nighttime show, which uh, which looks like it's going to be spectacular. Um, uh, I think there's a few of us that are going to be flying from Darlingmore Airfield on the morning of the 14th. Um, if you want to join us, then leave me a message in the comments below and we will see what we can arrange. Uh, after that, we've got the Shobden Air Fest on the 22nd of June, which I'm looking forward to. Um, and then also the SSDR and the Sub-70 Rally. Now, previously that's been held at New Farm uh, Airfield, but as I said earlier, New Farm sadly no longer operational. However, Courtney is still hosting the event, but this time it's gonna be at uh, Sackville, which is uh, uh, east of uh, Northampton. And that's on the 29th of June. Um, I'll put uh, Courtney's details in the description below. You need to PPR um, for that event because there's limited numbers. Um, so if you send Courtney an email and let him know that you're going, if you want to go, that promises to be a, another fantastic camping trip. Uh, Flexwing flying on the 13th and 14th of July. I'm looking forward to that's at Ruffith Airfield. That'll be another camp over event. Um, I'm hoping to go camping again with uh, with Giles Fowler. Um, and then I'm also hoping that the Grand Tours um, care of uh, micro aviation at more they're going to be organizing a number of events throughout the year i'll put their details down below as well um, so you can keep up to date with all of that so i'm hoping to go somewhere with them uh, and then finally next month uh, i've got something planned which i'm so excited about i'm going to be flying something completely different something which uh, i never thought i would ever have a go at um, a number of people have had a guess already uh, as to what it might be somebody suggested it was a gyro no it's not a gyro nobody's got it right so far if you want to have a guess as to what you think it might be leave it in the comments below there's no prizes for getting it right it's just a bit of fun um, but i will be videoing videoing that and everything else that I've just mentioned. So if you want to see that, then make sure that you subscribe to the channel so that you see those videos as they come up. And lastly, just before I go, um, a number of people made comments uh, when I was at Popham that they really like the events calendar that I put together. Um, however, they have asked, can I please slow it down because they've had trouble screenshotting it. So at the very end of the video, I will flash up the events calendar, but I will slow it right down so you've got time to screenshot it. Keep yourselves up to date. Right, that is it. I am done and I will see you next month.